Hello, and welcome back to the Ask the Color Expert podcast. Today's special guest is not exactly in the hair industry, but what he has to say and what he brings to this interview, you are going to want to listen to as both a stylist behind the chair, as a salon owner, as an educator, as anyone really walking planet earth needs to hear what this man has to say. So getting ready to introduce him, I just shared with him, he has quite a bio when you research him online. I'm super impressed that he even has time for me. Uh, He is an Emmy award-winning motivational keynote speaker. He is an author, a musician, and a workforce expert. He's a professional drummer, so he has tied his drumming into his live performances. And his most recent book is what I wanted us to chat about today. It's called I Love It Here, How Great Leaders Create Organizations People Never Want to Leave. So thank you so much, Clint Pulver, for being my special guest today. I'm very excited about this chat. Thanks, Elaine. I appreciate it. This is exciting. This is going to be fun. You're welcome. So as I said, what you do is you and I had an hour chat even before the date of our recording. And I was so intrigued by everything that you do and so impressed with you creating something that did not exist and turning it into not only a career, but leading into your books and what you speak about in your keynotes and and basically putting you on the map. So I would love for you to share your millennial experiment and uh, that story that you shared with me was amazing. Yeah, so five years ago, I was a part of a mastermind group with other CEOs and executives and we were in New York City and we were meeting with other business professionals. It was super cool, the hustle and bustle of a big city. And one of the gentlemen that we met with uh, owned a large sporting good retail store and we're in there and we're talking about his business and I'll never forget, he had this thick New York accent and he said, you got to adapt in business or you're going to die. <laughs> if you don't adapt, you're going to die. And I was like, wow, you know, fairly profound statement, but I also agreed with him. You know, we've, we've got to change. The market's always changing. So we need to adapt and make sure that we're relevant as a business. So then I asked him, but what about, what about your people? What about your management style? Have you felt the need to adapt there as well? And he fired back and he said, no, nah, no, 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 not there. Now, the way I manage today is the same way I managed 20 years ago. And we get results. Another fairly profound statement. And I remember when he said that, Elaine, I looked around in the store and all of his workers, all the employees were my age or younger. I'm a millennial. So they were millennials or Gen Z. And I remember thinking, hmm, I wonder, I wonder if they would say the same thing. And so I thank the guy for his time. We had 35 minutes to kill until we needed to be to our next appointment. I had nothing else better to do. I'm literally just wasting time and I'm in the store. And mind you, I look like a customer. I am a customer. I have a backwards hat on, I'm wearing a hoodie. And I I see this employee not far away. And I just, out of curiosity, I walked up, I introduced myself and I said, hey, uh, I'm just curious, what's it like to work here? The employee got really quiet started to look around. I felt like we were doing an illegal drug exchange. (laughs) And he said, do you really want to know? And I said, yeah. He goes, man, I can't stand it here. Mm. He's like, dude, like we're all cogs in the wheel, man. Like this is just a job. And uh, yeah, man, I don't even think my manager knows I'm here right now. And then I I remember I said, well, why are you working here then? And he said, oh, dude, I've already applied to three other places. As soon as I get a chance to bounce, uh, I'm gone. And I remember going, oh my gosh, like, okay. Well, maybe he's having a bad day, right? Maybe this kid just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. So I went and asked another employee and another and another and another. And in the 35 minutes that I had, I interviewed six of his team members. And at the end of those six conversations, Elaine, five out of the six of his employees said they would not be working for this guy and his store in less than three and a half months. Every one of them would be gone. Uh, that, that was really, that was like the moment for me where it was so evident that the perception of leadership versus the reality of the employee experience, most of the time is night and day different. You know, here, here this leader thought, oh yeah, we're, we're killing it. You know, we got a successful business, you know, profitability's off the charts, we're adapting to the market. 
but his people were miserable. And he had no clue. I, I think that most managers, unfortunately, have no idea they're doing poorly when they're doing poorly. They have no clue because there's no incentive for an employee to speak their truth. Right. I remember when I, I had the, the corporate America job and I'd go up to an, you know, uh, my manager and my manager would sit me down and we'd have the one-on-one -on -one management meeting and he'd be like, what can I do to be better for you? I, I never, I never like gave him the honest truth because I didn't want to be blacklisted. I right. didn't want to be the dramatic one. You know, what employee is going to sit down with their boss and say, well, I just want you to know you micromanage like a Nazi, <laughs> right? Or you're the, you're the person that always is telling us, you know, to do this or that, or every time we have a win, you take the credit. Mm. Or every time we mess up, you blame everybody else. It's never your fault. What employee is going to tell their, unless they just literally don't care and they're already halfway out the door moving to somewhere else anyways. Most employees will just be quiet. And they'll be like, no, no, it's awesome. It's great. And then they'll just leave three months later. And then the manager sits there going, oh, it's just oh, dang millennials. It's so hard. Right, to right, right. It's so hard <laughs> to find good talent. Oh, you just can't get kids to work these days. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. And, and, and that was really the moment. That was the moment for me, Elaine, that started a four and a half year research study. And I created uh, an organization called the Undercover Millennial Program. And it's kind of like Undercover Boss without the makeup. And <laughs> for the last four and a half years, I've worked with 181 organizations. And I have interviewed undercover over 10,000 employees. Wow. As the Undercover Millennial. And what we were able to do is create an environment purely based off of my age, where I was able to walk in and say, hey, I'm just thinking about applying. What's it like to work here? And the employee would tell me everything. And then we could take that, that research, that, that, that honesty, and create significant change. We could, we could close the gap between that perception of leadership versus the reality of the employee experience and allow leadership to see the hearts and minds of their people in a way that they had never seen on a survey, in a way that they never get in a one-on-one -on -one management meeting. And in doing so, they, they changed and they improved and they became organizations that were significant for people, not just successful. And we wrote a book about it and we titled the book, I Love It Here how great leaders create organizations their people never want to leave because that was the magic of the research. When I would go into a hair salon or I'd go into a bank or I'd go into a retail store and I'd walk up and I'd just, hey, I'm just thinking about applying and I'm just looking for work. You know, what's it like to work here? Would you recommend it? And when those, those stylists, when those employees, when they would fire back and say, oh my gosh, I love it here. We, we love it here, but I, I mean, it's a wonderful place to work. You know what we do, they're flexible, they understand us, they, they care about us. And then with that would trend from employee to employee to employee. That was really the, the, the significance and to find out what leaders were doing, what salon owners were doing to create organizations that people never wanted to leave. And that's yeah, why- in the, in the salon world, it's the dreaded uh, staff meeting that has been since the beginning of time you know, once or twice a quarter, you know, at the most. And it's the the leadership speaking to the group, almost like a bullets and announcement. You know, this is what's going on. We're changing shampoo lines, the color lines, da, da, da. it's like a all points bulletin. And the, you know, I was on the employee side in the beginning of my career and we would all, you know, be huddled in the break room, which is, I call it the broke room because everybody's in there bitching and they're not making any money. They're just complaining. And everybody would be fired up saying, we're going to tell them, you know, that we don't want to do this anymore. And we're all going to stick together. And then whoever was the poor soul that had to say it for the group expected everyone to back them up. And when they would say it, yeah. the way that the, the owner reacted, everybody just shrunk back in their chairs and was like, I didn't, I didn't say that. I don't, I don't agree with that. So I stopped. I mean, I've owned a salon for 30 years. I haven't done a meeting in probably 12 years. I just stopped it altogether because it didn't do any good. You know, the, the owner dreads it because they know people are just going to bring things to the table and complain about things. And the employees don't like it because number one, they're missing billable time behind their chair to sit in this meeting. 
Okay. So the, the system is so antiquated and outdated. And I love that you, you brought that creative way of showing them with your little, your little pen camera, you know, like, look, I'm not making this up. This is the way that your people feel. And, and it hurts, you know, when you open yourself up to feedback, even when they say it's um, anonymous, you know, I did a brunch one time with the whole staff and I had somebody come in and they facilitate it and they said, everybody's going to get uh, an index card and, you know, say something great about your coworker and then say something that you feel they need to improve. And it was supposed to be anonymous and you knew exactly who wrote what. And it hurt when you heard the negative, you're like, ouch, but it's there. It's the elephant in the room. So just because you never asked for it on a three by five card, it's there. Totally. And again, like as, as the leader, as the owner of the salon, right? You're the number one reason why people stay. You're also the number one reason why people leave. Right. Uh, you know, when, when an employee hated their job, they talked about the manager. When an employee loved their job, they talked about a mentor. They talked about mm. someone who advocated, didn't just develop. It's not all about like, you know, get here on time, do your job, don't complain, don't whine, don't, you know, make sure you sell this product, make sure we're doing an upsell for every, like, that's the development side of the business. But to employees, what really matters to them are the intangibles. It's the things that we can't, you, you can't really put it in a spreadsheet. Right. It's the times where people go, man, I like myself best because I'm here. You know, I experience my best self when I'm with you. And I think that's important to ask yourself as the leader, right? How do people experience themselves when they're with you? How do they experience you? How do they experience themselves when they're with you? And it, and it really, really matters because here's the thing. If you don't, and there's that mentality that many owners, they don't have. They just like, I'm not here to be your friend. Okay, be glad you have a job. I show you that I love you because I give you a paycheck. Then, then be okay with the revolving door of turnover. Then be okay with constantly having to try to find people to take shifts to find people to staff the chairs. Be, be fine with, with toxicity r rampant in your salon. Be okay with low morale. Be okay with low productivity. And it's costing you thousands of dollars. I don't think sometimes we really understand when someone leaves and they don't come back, what that costs you in hiring and what you lose in productivity, what you lose in efficiency, what, you know, and again, just the morale of, of a salon. And why not? Why can't we just tweak a few things? Why can't we just learn to listen a little bit more? Why can't we do a few things? And that's what I saw that great leaders were doing. And it paid back in spades, not just financially, not like, not just, you know, on the P&L statement, mm -hmm. but my goodness, you actually created an environment where people thrived at work. They didn't just survive. They weren't stressed out. It wasn't just a job. They weren't walking on eggshells. Like it was a culture where people felt safe to contribute. People felt safe to open up and to talk. And, and you know what, if I have a concern, I could go to my manager because I know my manager has my back and I know my manager really cares. And she actually values my opinion. Now, yes, she has standards. Yes, she understands that we run a business and she's got, you know, uh, she's got expectations, but she also gives a darn about who I am and that I've got a life outside of the salon. You know, what, what a concept, right? What a concept. And uh, those, those small little changes over time, little by little, it becomes a lot. I love that you said life outside of the salon because that's the one thing that, you know, people do complain about the millennial work ethic, but it's because it's foreign to other generations. We were the grind generation, you know, work 12 hours a day, don't take a lunch break, squeeze people in, come in early, stay late. And we're, you know, my generation, when we see the millennial saying, I don't even want to work five days. I want to do a four day schedule. I want to do a three day schedule. There, there's something, as you know, uh, the situation with it's mirroring and it's like, you're pissed off because you didn't think of it. <laughs> you just worked your butt off for all those years and they're doing it smarter and they have That's more better. work life balance, you know? So I love that they're bringing that into our industry and that salons are finally adapting to a new way of doing things. It doesn't have to be Tuesday through Saturday because it always was. Women don't only wash their hair on Saturday anymore the way they did in the 60s. You know, things just stay the yes. way that they are for no other reason than that's just the way that they are. <laughs> yes. 
yeah, things change, right? And we need to change with that. And, and I will say this in the same vein, you know, if we can, the, the quicker we can stop looking at millennials as millennials and look at them as people, the more mm-hmm. significant you will become in their lives. You know, I see a lot of owners and managers and they have this mentality and they read three articles in Forbes and, you know, all of the other managers complain about a younger generation. So then all of a sudden they stereotype every young person and they automatically think, ah, you're entitled. Ah, you're that little brat that doesn't want to work five days. Ah, you're the, you're the, you're the, the one that just wants to rise to the top. And all of a sudden you want a 20% increase in pay. Like they, they like we create these stereotypes and in my research, 10,000 people, and that wasn't just millennials. It wasn't just Gen Z. It was boomers. It was Xers, all the generations. And I saw some massively entitled lazy boomers. I also saw some massively entitled and lazy millennials. But I also saw millennials that were had a crazy work ethic, beautiful communicators, talented, skilled, willing to earn it. I also saw the same in, in, in boomers. But there, there's like this mentality, like boomers hated the hippies. You know, it was like, cut your hair, hippie, right? We always hated the younger generation. And now the Gen X is doing it to millennials and millennials are doing it to Gen Z. Get rid of the stereotype. Right. Stop, stop looking at somebody based off of a generation, off the year they were born. You cannot do a one size fits all approach and say, uh, well, you were born in, in, in the eighties. So that means that you don't give a rip and that you're just going to like, you can't do that. Right. You know, that's a fallacy in leadership and it'll ruin your chance for connection. I think speaking of connection, I think my most difficult thing as a leader was being friendly and personal without the boundary being crossed into, you know, not holding someone accountable and letting people get away with things because we're more friendly, you know, not being able to discipline or, um, you know, tell somebody when they're doing something wrong because it's like, oh, we, we just had dinner on Saturday night and, you know, now the the gray area is getting crossed over into, and, and that's, that's the extremes in our industry. It's either, you know, so run as a corporation where you don't even know who the owner of the business is. They never come into the salon. They don't even know your name yeah. or it's so personal that people end up staying in a situation that no longer is a good fit for them. But they're like, Oh my gosh, I grew up with her as my mentor and as my boss and I can't leave her. And that's that emotional um, crisscross that, that happens. You're absolutely right. In every organization, in our research, we found there were four types of managers. Four types in, in every salon, in every retail store, in every hospitality chain. Like they're, they literally are in every organization. And I could always trace back to the satisfaction or the dissatisfaction of the employees to two things. The standards of that manager and their ability to connect or the lack of either or of those. So those were the two variables. So standards would be something, for example, like, I need you to show up on time. Uh, we do have uh, quotas. We've got sales numbers to hit. Uh, I need you to work at least four days a week. Like those are our standards. That's what we require. The connection piece would be the empathy, uh, you know, understanding that they have a life outside of work, getting to the part about them. You know, do you not just know the employee? Do you know their family? You know their kids? You know, that the, the intangibles, the soft skills. Those two things. So the first manager that we find in every salon was the removed manager. So this was the manager that's low on standards, also low on connection. They're just burnt out. They should have stopped managing like 15 years ago. Mm. Just tired. They're kind of in the salon, but they're not into the salon. They're just, uh, they're just there and they kind of sit back and they'll take a few clients, but most of the time they just bark orders. Handle the schedule, do your job. I don't really care who you are. You're filling in a, in a, in a seat and I don't know, just make sure the place doesn't burn down. <laughs> so what does this create in the workforce? Disengagement. This is where you find people that are like, yeah, they don't care if I show up on time or not. They don't care if I, you know, I upsell. They don't care about the numbers. They don't care about the customer experience. So why should I care? The second manager that we find is the buddy manager. So this is the manager that's low on standards, but they're high on connection. So this is a manager that wants to be everybody's friend. They want to be liked more than they're respected. Mm -hmm. This is the manager that would like, you know, they'll go shopping with with all the other workers on on the weekends. And then Monday morning, they're like, 
productivity's down. You know what, Sal, you need to show up more. And everyone's like, what? We just went and, 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 and shopped and used coupons on Saturday. And you talked about <laughs> our friendship. And now all of a sudden you're the boss and high and mighty. So it created a sense of entitlement where employees were like, oh, come on, oh, we're sisters. Oh, come on, we're, 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 we're like besties. Don't you understand? Like it created almost this sense where the employee became more of the boss than the boss did. Guarantee you've seen that where different workers in the salon, they almost run the salon more than the manager does. Yes. The third though, the third uh, fairly common, unfortunately was the controller. So this is the manager that's really high on standards, low on connection. The old command and control model, put your head down, go to work, don't whine. Okay, I want you here five days a week. I don't care what you're doing at home. I don't care what your husband's doing to you. I don't care, we have a business to run. Okay, I give you the paycheck, do your job. This created rebellion. It's fear-based tactics, it's all manipulation. It's all, you know, I'll fire you. I'll replace you in a day if you don't like. And so it was, it was management trying to go toe to toe constantly with every employee instead of shoulder to shoulder. And they did get results, by the way. You know, you can scare a lot of people into listening to you. You can threaten people, you can be that rough, tough person that everybody fears. It never lasts though. Right. It never lasts. They will go somewhere else eventually. That just burns people out quicker than anything. But the fourth, the fourth manager, mm, this was the magic. And I call them the mentor manager. They were high on standards, but they were equally high on their ability to connect. And what did this create? Respect every time. They were not always liked, but they were respected. And they knew that, that you know, I, I think one of the greatest lessons in leadership is for a leader to remember that every one of your employees is asking you this question. Let me know when it gets to the part about me. Mm. Let me know when your salon and, 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 and you know, the profitability and, and the scheduling, let me know when that considers me. And we hear that in leadership. And the first thing a lot of us do, we, we think, well, those entitled little shining stars in my life, <laughs> right? Like, oh, if I hear that one more time, let me know Let me know when it gets to the part about me. No, 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 no. It is not about entitlement. It's about good business. And if you do not get to the part about them, I promise you, they will go and find some other salon that will. And that's why the salons that are adapting and understanding, okay, I need to connect. I need to advocate. Long gone are the days where you can look at an employee like a fireplace and say, give me heat, then I'll give you wood. Like it just mm. doesn't work, right? Where it's like, give me the productivity, show up on time, and then we'll, we'll talk about recognition. We'll talk about an increase in pay or why you matter in this organization. No, 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 we've got to flip the script because no significant loyalty will ever happen without significant connection. When we make those deposits of trust, when they know that you're an advocate, not just the developer, even though that's still important, when we make those deposits, it allows us to then make the withdrawals. I'm not sitting here preaching that, oh, it's all sunshine and rainbows and just love everybody and make sure everyone feels protected and safe. No, no, you have a business to run. You have profitability that needs to be earned, productivity, but that will not happen without significant connection. It will not last without significant connection. I love that. So when you gave the businesses the feedback on how happy or unhappy their employees were, is that, did you then go in and help them fix the issues or was your job just to show that shine a light on what the issues were? Yeah. So if, if it was a smaller company and if I was using undercover cameras, uh, I would never show the footage. Uh, if it's a bigger company and I can protect employee privacy, then we'll show the video. Um, the goal was never to figure out who needs to be fired the next day right. or who needs to be promoted. The goal was to maintain complete, complete, complete privacy while also opening up transparency by letting people really see what's there. So we always took that into account. And then I would present. I would come in and I would work with the management and I would let them know this is what I saw. These were the trends. These are the things I'm hearing. This is what's happening. And then over the years, as I would do this more and more and more and more, I started seeing consistent trends when employees were thriving. When, when employees were saying, I love it here. 
And then I could figure out, okay, why? Well, it's because Susie was a mentor manager, not a controlling manager. Now I saw that Steve constantly was doing status interviews with his people. And then, oh my goodness, and so was Rebecca in a totally different industry, but they were getting the same result. So I was able to start to, to pull out these unique principles that when people, when, when people talked about good leadership and what that looked and felt like to them, it started to trend within these principles. And then I would train those organizations on those things. And then they would start to implement that slowly but surely and consistently. The coolest part about leadership is that it matters. The hardest part about leadership is that it matters every day. And so over time, uh, those small efforts and organizations began to thrive. Retention increased. People started to feel happy. They started to see a change. Uh, productivity increased. Profitability increased because they weren't always having to, to hire other people and pay for uh, all of the things that goes into that. So, yeah, it, it's been an evolving, very cool thing to be a part of. And at the end of the day, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we spend so much time at work. Mm -hmm. And the thought of, of creating a, a place where, again, people, people just, you know, they didn't just love their job, but they actually loved who they were at or who they were while they were at their job. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been very fulfilling for me uh, to, to play a small part in that. So. I think what happens too is, is the overwhelm of all the different, you know, I used to go to uh, an event annually that was for the business of the hair salon. It was called the art of business. And yeah. I looked forward to it every year because it wasn't techniques on, you know, turning people's hair, different colors or thumping music or any of the other things. It was really getting down to the nitty gritty with leadership. And the one thing that always drove me crazy early in my years of being an owner was you have to have systems, you have to have systems. And they would just use the word systems over and over and over again, but they wouldn't say what the system was. Yeah. And it was always like a little, you know, 45 minute keynote, you know, to get you to say, well, what is the system? And then you sign up for their system and you try that. And then it may be too rigid for your particular culture. And then people start to feel like they have homework and they have to like track things and, and fill out a journal and stuff like that. So I actually just did another podcast interview with a friend who's a fellow salon owner. And she, at the end of the interview, she rattled off five different systems. She bought all of them. And I'm like, you're just going to keep buying another one, another one, another one. You have to, to your point, it has to be, you know, conducive to you and your culture and the way that you are. Like, you're not going to change everything about you to fit into a system when the people in your culture don't respond to that system. So I think that's a lot of what's going on in that, in our industry is the overwhelm of all these different coaches and all these different systems. And what, what is the right one? People will say, well, which one's the right one? Well, there is no right one. It's what is right for you and your organization. And I think that's the hardest thing to figure out. Yeah, there's, there's two things that I think are worth mentioning within that. Great mentors were always being mentored. So when I found a significant leader or a great manager, or someone who was making a difference and they created this environment that was significant, not just successful, they were always being mentored. They had somebody, whether it was a coach, even a book, uh, they were doing, you know, they had some system, right? They had some accountability partner. They had someone that they had seen in the hair industry that they just looked up to. And they collaborated with them a lot and they took their problems to them and that made them more efficient. That made them more effective. So great mentors were always being mentored. So there is a side of that that is important. Uh, you put a hard to catch horse in a field with an easy to catch horse, you usually end up with two hard to catch horses. Same thing <laughs> in leadership, right? So who are you surrounding yourself with? Um, do whatever it takes to associate with extraordinary leaders who are running salons that you want to run. You want your culture to feel like that connect with those people. The second aspect though that I would add to this though is listen to your people, darn it. They will tell you more on, on an effective system and what would work and what they would like and what they would want more than anything else. And I, I truly believe that even though sometimes we think, well, you, they have no clue. You know, they don't know what our, our, our overhead is. You know, they don't know what we pay for product. And, you know, they're sitting there telling us, well, we should just get things for free. And like, but I think it will give you insight if you are willing to listen. I think a lot of the time 
as leaders, you know, you've heard that age old adage, Elaine, if you, uh, if you give a man a fish, then you feed him for a day. Mm -hmm. But if you can teach him how to fish, oh, then you feed him for a lifetime. Every time, every time I hear that, I think to myself, who said the guy wanted a fish? <laughs> right? Like, I'm kind of more of a steak guy. <laughs> the, the point is, the point I'm trying to make is sometimes as leaders, we go in or we manage the salon and we just kind of go, this is the way we're going to do it. This is the way I want to do it. This is the way I saw Sally do it. So I'm going to do it the same way. And we don't pause for a minute and think and, and just go, okay, well, would this work with my people? Because every salon has a different culture. Every salon has different people. So obviously that would create a different community that vibes and, and jives with different things. So I think it's really important for you as a, as a leader. I, I learned in aviation, I, was, I went to flight school, was a pilot for a long time. Every airplane had a manual. It had like a user guide. It would tell you at what speed you needed to take off at, what need, speed you needed to slow down for landing, at what speed the airplane would stall. But that never replaced really getting in the seat and flying the plane. Instinct, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we can't do, we can't just all of a sudden read some leadership book or go to, you know, watch some system and then all of a sudden just come in guns a blazing and just implement it. And, and then we get frustrated with why things aren't changing. And then we get another system and we all of a sudden see the same result. And it's just Absolutely. this. So can I really quickly just give one takeaway, like one, like, like something that, a, a salon owner could do right now that would maybe put them on the right track of creating a better culture, creating an organization where people maybe feel a little bit more seen, heard, and understood. Is that, is that cool? I, I'm looking at I would time. love that. Yeah, you're great. So um, I also spent a little bit of time in the medical world. I was an orthopedic consultant for a long time. Is um, there anything you have? How old are you? A hundred? <laughs> oh, I feel like it. I feel like it. Okay, I wake Pilot. Up. Yep. <laughs> go down to tie my shoes. And I'm like, what else can I do while I'm down here? I'm getting old. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so in the medical world, in the OR, the doctor would call out frequently and ask for a status update. I need a status update on the patient. What are they doing? How are they looking? Give me the status. What, they re what they're really asking are what are the vital signs of the patient? So we all as living human beings have four vital signs, our heart rate, our respiratory rate, our body temperature, and our blood pressure. Okay, if one of those four things is out of whack, you're in trouble. Employees have the same things. And what you do in the medical world is when you're treating a patient, you look at the vital signs because the vitals determine treatment. Vitals determine treatment. After we would treat a patient, we would then recheck the vitals and then you treat them again. And we would do that until healthy stability is maintained long-term. It's not rocket science. But that is the principle. And so I found this routinely in my research that good leaders were conducting one-on-one -on -one what I call a status interview. This is not a one-on-one -on -one management meeting. This is not a time for you to sit down with an employee and check their performance and go over you know, issues. And that's not what this is about. This is a moment that's almost informal. You could do it on the phone. You could do it over a Zoom call. You could do it in the salon. You could do it back in your office. You could go on a walk. It doesn't matter. The goal of this interview is to first start with vocal praise. And I want everybody to think right now of your three best rock stars in your salon. Like who are your best people that if they left tomorrow, they would hurt your salon. You'd be in a hard spot. Because I think it's really worth considering right now, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic. Uh, 2020 had the highest retention rates that we've seen in a long time because everybody was nervous about COVID. Everybody right. was grateful if they had a job, right? They were just grateful if they had hours of people were coming into the salon to get their hair cut. Now we're coming out of this. And employees, they remember two things. They remember one, how they were treated during the chaos. And second, they've all had time to think. You know, is this really where I want to be? Is the job today, you know, the same as it was in 2019? Or has everything changed? You know, a lot of people were furloughed. A lot of people are doing three times the work because they had to lay off all of the staff. Yeah. People are now realizing, oh my gosh, I can, I can, I can work. I can live in Colorado and work in New York city. And, and people are even just leaving the hair salon industry altogether. They yeah. just want something else. So it's really important right now to, to take the time to check the status. So 
you start with vocal praise. And then first question is this, what can I do to keep you here? It's not simple. 99.9% .9 of employees are never asked that question because sometimes the managers are afraid to ask, mm. you know, what if I, you know, what can I do to keep you here? And they're like, oh, I want to, I Give me the give me the window side of the salon and I want a 20% increase in pay and give me a percentage on all sales of product and, and you know, maybe add a few beanbag chairs in the back. <laughs> people are like, I can't do that, right? Like, I don't, I don't have the money for that. But here's the thing is the point is to check the status. And if they say, you know what, I, four days is really hard right now because Dave's working two jobs and, uh, you know, she, and Sally's, she's in ballet now and I, I really want to be there. You know, that, that's an opportunity for you to advocate, to really listen. And, and maybe you can't pay them more, but maybe you can adjust the schedule in some way. You don't know until you ask. Right. And if you can't do what they're asking for, look for a, a, another opportunity. Look for something else. You know, I really need you to work four days. So are you okay working for four days for the next three weeks until I can find somebody else so that we can get you to where you need to be? So that's the first question. Second question is this. What's getting in the way of your success at the salon? Is it, is it Brittany? Is it Jessica? Is, is it me? Is it the pay? Is it the schedule? You don't know. You don't know until you ask. What's getting in the way of your success? And then the third question, what can I do to help you get there? That is a moment, Elaine, that you can create in the lives of your people that allows you to become the mentor, not just the boss. It allows you to be someone who actually gives a darn, mm -hmm. who, who, who is interested in helping them to live a lifestyle, not just a job at work. Um, and, and it was so powerful to see that and how they created this opportunity of vocal praise. I need you, we want you, you're incredible in this salon. I value what you do. What can I do to keep you here? what's getting in the way of your success and how can I help you get there? It's one of the greatest things you want to, you want to figure out a system, something in your, in there your it salon. Is. Right. Get there it people, is. Start there. That's amazing. So simple yet. So profound all at the same time. Love it. Well, I could talk to you forever and I'm amazed. I, I want to see how many more careers comes out next time we talk. <laughs> <laughs> Life you are fun. you are a multi potentialite. You definitely uh, live life to the fullest, and I love that. And I can't wait to see what's next for you. Um, so tell people how to find you and see more of you. Um, a website, where to get the book, all of those good things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the website is clintpulver.com, and the book is available on Amazon. It's titled "I Love It Here." And uh, I'm on all the social media platforms and all the things. And I just really appreciate you, Elaine. Um, there's a lot of people that you could choose to be on the show. And uh, you gave me the time. And I uh, appreciate that. I appreciate everyone that's listening and uh, look forward to connecting in the future. Thank you. Fun. And thank you for your time. I appreciate you as well. And, and you're so, so amazing to talk to and so interesting. And I can't wait to see more of you. We, we need you in the beauty industry. We have to get you into our shoes. Let's do it. We, we need to see the drum, the drum show too. I think that's awesome. It's a good time. <laughs> it's a good time. Thank well, you. thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. We will see you on the next one.